stocks, bonds, ETFs, straight out of downtown Chicago. This is Zach's Market Edge. Welcome to Zach's Market Edge, the podcast about investing in your life. I'm your host, Tracy Reinick, and this week I'm joined by Zach's chief equity strategist, John Blank, who's also a PhD economist, to talk about our favorite topic. This is the one we do several times a year, but especially at the end of the year, because this is kind of our look forward time. And it's, will there be a recession in 2024? We've, uh, like I said, do this every year. Last year, we did it in December of 2023 about whether or not there would be a recession in 2023. And we mostly got it right last year when we looked at the data, as we always do, and especially that jobs data. And John and I both uh, concluded that it w- there was no looming recession in December 2023 um, or December 2022. Uh, but that maybe we might get one towards the end of the year or maybe even pushed off into 2024. So here we are a year later. We still haven't gotten the recession. Everybody's still wondering whether or not we're going to get it, but maybe in 2024. So welcome, John. Welcome to our annual show. Thanks, Tracy. Always good to do this. We got to do this and update people because that's what we tell people what, that they should do. So we need to do the same. Right, right. So we always start off with that jobs data whenever we do this show. And I was struck by the jobs data when I listened to last year's podcast, because if I didn't know any better, it it almost sounded like this year's job data, at least as far as the jobless, the weekly jobless claims part. But even the monthly uh, BLS data was not that different. Um, The number of jobs created was different from a year ago when things were a lot hotter, but like the overall unemployment rate was not all that different from last year. It's gone up a little bit, but not that much. So, so where are we as we, as we end the year here? Yeah. So Tracy, we always tell people to do this. So let's do this. Um, You go to the employment situation summary on bls.gov. And you look for the employment situation October 23, which is going to be updated November here in three days. We're talking on Tuesday, December the 5th. And you do two things. First of all, you read the first paragraph. Total non-farm payroll employment increased by 150,000 in October, and the unemployment rate changed little at 3.9%. Employment declined in manufacturing due to strike activity. So First off, we always point out that 125000 a month is steady state employment growth. So that means that the actual increase was about $25,000 over the steady state. So there was certainly no recession in October. Now, the other thing we always point out is the difference between signal is noise is that is actually a quick release because they try to get out top of the month. And you should always go to the last paragraph of the same report and read the revised data for the last two months. So let's do this. The change in total on farm payroll appointment for August was revived down 62,000 from 227 to 165. So if it is truly 165 as a signal away from the noise, that's still better than the 150 in October. The change from the September was revised down from 39,000 from 336 to 297. And of course, 297 is twice what October was. So 165, 297, and 150 are the, the the numbers for the monthly payroll reports. Tracy, what is the chance there is a recession in hand right now? Zero. Zero. That's the answer, everybody. <laughs> we do this every year because there's not a we don't want to. I mean, if you, any of you ever golf with me. This is how we start golfing on the first tee, and we wrap up the recession discussion by the first tee. You do not talk recessions beyond the first tee with me. (laughs) (laughs) So the zero percent, that is what's amazing though, right? Zero, zero percent chance, zero percent chance, people, of a recession right now. Realize that the next time you're sitting where wasting your time with some guy in a tee, tee box. Right. Um, but that can change quickly. This is what I hear. You know, people are like, but it can plunge down. Yeah. Okay. So we got to address some of these, it can change quickly. things. Yeah. 
Okay, so first off, we got the ISM services and the um, S and P services PMI today. They were both, you know, between fifty point five and fifty one point five. So they're basically above expansion, slightly above. And they're they've been expanding the services for eleven months. Eleven months, and it's really, I mean, the one thing to understand about the PMIs is that five diesels of five matter for for a GDP point. So one point above 50 is basically, you know, something like two tenths of, a, of growth. It's very little growth. However, it is expanding and it's expanding for 11 months. And I looked just before the show at how much services is in the U.S. economy. And it is 78 percent. 78 percent. So now the ISM manufacturing, we all know, is in the high 48, 47, 46 ish area and is you know, been down for 15 months. So wait, basically 80% at 51% with 20% that's been declining for 13, 14 months. And what you're finding out is what the payrolls are telling us. It's basically a flat economy, right? So, you know, you could argue all you want and the guys who are going to do the ISM and the manufacturing expectation sub-index in the ISM, which is in the leading indicators that they're going down. That is true. Uh, but it is true for a very, very critical distinction to this uh, event, this time, versus any other time since the post-war era. And that is every other cycle people worried about was a demand-driven phenomenon, right? It was aggregate demand. So if we're worried about market forces, all other situations we have been in have been driven by the demand side. This is why all the discussions about monetary policy and all the other things you learned in your textbooks were all directed to this. This is the first time in 100 years, and it's the first time in any data you're going to get on Fred going back 67 years, where it was a supply shock and aggregate supply expansion from a public health emergency that is the, the, the defining event of what we're looking at. So supply as the fundamental aggregate market force versus demand a fundamental aggregate demand force, totally different situation. So the only thing different now than a year ago is we have matriculated out of that supply shock with through these the manufacturing and the and the, and the goods price inflation that's dissipated. But we are carrying on with this now what is a traditional demand driven economy, the service economy, and the service economy is basically fine. And that's what you should pick up is. We still don't have the trigger for this big decline. The other thing I told people in the investment committee at Zacks not too long ago, two weeks ago, is if you look to 2006 to 2008, before the financial crisis, before the black swan, it was very apparent in the data, declining starts, declining home prices that was registering for two years. There was no surprise in front of the financial crisis. There was none. The other thing was, is the financial crisis happened after two years of negative macroeconomic data. It was very obvious. And there's one other critical distinction between that and this, which is then you had some very flimsy financial structures, balloon mortgages, no, no doc for payments, all this stuff. This time around, you have the total opposite. You have everybody, you know, 15 years of emergency lending, locking in 3%, 3.5% fixed year mortgages. So the underlying structure of the finance is completely different. It's probably 180 degrees different if you're worried about that market. And then just as today, I looked into Redfin's call for the 2024 housing market, and it's basically flat. So where can I find a big trigger? The only place, Tracy, that I can find one is in the automotive market, right? Still depressed. Of our 16 sectors still down there at the bottom, uh, 15 million, 15 and a half million units versus 17 and a half million traditionally. Still facing price shocks and 10%, you know, auto loans. People who probably bought, you know, 80, 100 thousand dollar cars, if they lose their job, they're going to lose their car. That's a totally different fractional situation than a house, right? It is. It is entirely possible that the auto market will roll over. We'll have all this debris in the used auto market for a year or two, and it will clear in a way that nobody sees. That will be a headwind for this economy for the next two years. However, again, you got to remember, you got to find 
the way to that through the job market and the job market is strong. Yeah. Um, I noticed last year when we were talking about the weekly jobless claims, those we commented had not been over 250,000. And we have talked about how in the past they need to be over 300,000 to be signaling a recession is maybe coming. And so surprise, surprise, this year, again, last week's weekly initial claims were just 218,000, but the four week moving average 220,000. We have not yet gone over the 300,000, not even really close to that in this cycle. And the only area that is a little bit uh, different is that the continuing claims are finally on the rise. And those are up over 1.9 million now. And that indicates some people who are laid off are having a little bit uh, more difficulty finding something new than a year ago when there were more jobs available. So, you know, some people look at that and say, there, there it is. There's the, there's the data point that's showing the slowdown is here and the recession is here. But even that number isn't where it should be to indicate a recession, which is well over two, 2 million, right? Continuing claims. Yeah. And you got to remember, Tracy, we had a, you know, like I read the payroll number, you know, it was all reflected in strike activity. A lot of people, for example, Hollywood, you talk to people who have the Hollywood strike, they say generally to restart after the strikes are over, it takes two months. Yeah. Yeah. So continuing claims, people living on their claims until things restart, um, even if the strikes are over. So, right. Right. You know, again, just reading, just reading the BLS statistics, you know what the answer to committing a claim is. One, it is a little bit softer. The other is there's been strikes. And for people who are worried about, you know, the jolts, the job openings, labor force term our survey, which was 8.7 million this morning. Um, you remember, we went from 12 to 9, took us two years. So we did a million and a half a year. We were at seven in 2019. So we're at nine now, and we are doing a million and a half a year. We're not even get back to pre-COVID job openings for another year. So again, you know, thank you for trying to find the trigger, but the trigger can't be a calendar turn in the, in the in, you know, from December 31st to January 1st. It's not enough. And the other thing is, I, we, you know, we have a perma bear. We have a perma bear. We should let Tracy and I have a perma bear on staff. <laughs> And what he pointed out this morning, the perma bear in our staff said, hey, the estimate revisions for the fourth quarter are now zero. True. Absolutely true. Now, the estimate revisions for the first quarter are actually going up. <laughs> and, of course, GDP for the fourth quarter is 1.2 in the, in the GDP now. I don't dispute that. But if you average 5.2 in the third quarter, 1.2 in the second, in the fourth, you're going to get 6.4, and you're going to go back to trend growth. So basically, people did a little more spending in the summer than they're going to do in the fall and the winter. So that's the other thing is, why wouldn't we expect these things? So again, every perma bear you have, and we have one, we're as we have a perma bear, they're never going to tell you how it's couched into all the other nuances of what's going on, which is why the summary statistic, the summarizing statistic of the job market reflects all of those headwinds and tailwinds correctly and summarizes that that no matter what you think about all of that stuff, it's not reflecting in the job market. Therefore, there's no way for us to get a cycle going under this circumstance. Yeah. And uh, I've noticed a lot of uh, bearish people are kind of latching on to further consumer weakness because we are a services economy and that's a big part of it. And so every kind of, uh, you know, consumer issue they're latching on to, like you mentioned with the automobiles, there is a rise in auto loans, bad auto loans right now. <laughs> People are not paying. Um, that's not really a surprise. But even just listening to a lot of the retailers this earnings season, this is what we did last year too, because we're always doing this show in December. We're still getting the earnings reports from a lot of retailers and they're not seeing it. They're not seeing some kind of massive slowdown. And we're we're well past Black Friday now when we're recording this. So they have a lot of data about what's happening this holiday season. And we even just got Signet Jewelers in today, um, ticker SIG. So I was like, well, they're always a sign because you don't need jewelry. 
Like you, you can put that off if things are bad. You just don't buy it. But they're not really seeing it. They they have seen slowing sales from last year, but the um, they had some issues with like bridal and engagements because everything was kind of backed up during the pandemic. Then there was a huge rush of it, and now it's kind of slowed again. But they see that even coming back, and they said jewelry is popular this holiday season. So. The consumer isn't really pulling back. We also heard from Ulta, like we talked about last year with Ulta Beauty, ticker ULTA. And again, they they were a little cautious last year because they were expecting a recession. So they were more a little bit cautious. This year, still kind of cautious, but not really. Um, still seeing the consumer out there buying beauty products. So Again, like you can look at a lot of the different retailers. You can look at shoes, even on apparel side, it's not as bad. They're very highly promotional this holiday season, but they're not seeing the normal drop off that you would see if you were getting a recession um, or even like Signet saw when the COVID hit during that recession, you know, nobody was buying the jewelry <laughs> when COVID hit, but they're still, they're still out there doing it so I mean, Tracy, do you do you have access to the fred on this screen uh i can get it yeah yeah put up fred and i'll i'll have you tie something in just so I, people know i'm not cherry picking type, type in fred and show everybody the fred um do you want the just the overall site yeah just the fred just fred people should know how to get here just to show fred it there you go so find it there it is there it is pop it up okay search fred data so put in business formations retail. Okay. Click hit it. Here that hit click that top one. Projected business formations and four quarter retail trade. There you go. There it is. So yeah, that's looking pretty good. Now, this is projected business formations within the next four quarters. I just, we just pulled this up for you. This is retail trade. What you notice is it's way above the trend of the last 12 years. Retail, what happened was when COVID hit, here's another example of where, you know, you get really skewed stores. Of course, everything was shut. All these people shut. So all this retail space opened. And people went into it. it. It created this massive wave of new business formations in retail. And people are still adding new business formations. And this is, by the way, read it correctly, projected business formations within four quarters retail trade in the United States, November 13th. So this is all the way through and it passed the election. People are still by putting up norm retail. And it's noticeably higher, right? It's noticeably higher. And I did not cherry picked that. I did not. You know, we just got it right. There it is. So again, if you want to be a perma bear, you know, go on the comments page and tell us how you see perma bear event here through the consumption show. Yeah. So let's uh, try to answer the question then that we opened the podcast with. Will there be a recession in 2024? What's your take on that? Go, you know, go back to Fred again. Go, go back to the first slide. Yeah, you know, go to Fred, that first ping again. It hit, just hit recession probability, so when it comes up. There we go. Hit it, see what happens. Smooth U.S. recession probability. Let's do that. There it is. I'll pull that a little bit further up. There it is. <laughs> so it's 2%, yeah. Tracy. It's 2%. <laughs> Yes, it's very Now, again, I didn't cheat. I did not cheat. I just told you to type the top line on Fred. There There's it is. The here. And so, yeah, our perma bear is picking up that super minuscule rise from 0.36 in September to 2.2% in October. Um, and again, yeah, you know, scroll it out to like put in max, you know, go out to the, the, the max, hit max. Yeah. Now, you got. Obviously, some indicators, say, for example, in 2006-ish, of course, there was actually a, a little bit of a pop, right, in the early going of the housing market. That's what I was talking about. There was two years of decline before the financial crisis. You forgot about it, but there was. 
Now go go ahead again. Go back to Fred and hit housing starts. Now let's do this. Net private to hit that one. Top one. Now let's look at this. Go scroll it up a little bit for everyone to see that there it is. Now, what am I talking about? Look at the 2005 to 2009 decline in housing starts. Do you see that? Yes. Now, how long has it happened? That was from December 05, right, all the way down to March of 09. It was like four years. So, you, you know, you got the Nassim Taleb, you know, black swan event that comes after two and a half years of declining housing starts. Right. Now, look at where we are now. We've seen some decline. We did peak in April 2022, but that's right when the Fed started raising rates. But it's not as dramatic, and we've had like a one, at least one uh, rebound yeah. there. One point three seven, and the typical number you can see here is you know somewhere around one point five ish. Yeah, but we're we're a little soft, like ten percent soft. But you can easily draw a line from 2011 to 2000. 19 and of course even in 2000 go back to 2018 what were we at 1.4 of starts yeah so we're, we're even above back in 28 we're, we're 10 percent above that level yeah yeah so you know people talk about it being weak and all that stuff but at the end of the day it's not as weak as it's stronger than 2018 right right definitely. so i mean remember back in 2019 when people talked about recessions well look you know we're actually stronger in starts now than in 2019 that's what it is. So again, if you want to remind yourself, this is what happens. People forget that financial crises happen after two years of declines in housing starts. It's very, very clear. And it was dramatic, and it was serial, and it went down super hard and super fast. It's not clear that that's happening at all right now, right? In fact, there was a bit of a pop there back when we had the when the, when the rates fell back in March a bit. What, what right, that? right. Yeah, that was June-ish, the summer, we got some, yeah. some buying going on, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For here, sure. Here's what happens when you use data, right? I mean, if again, back to the first T, you know, you're talking to the guy about a recession, he's just in a fantasy world unless he's paying attention to data like this. Right, right. This is always good to point out every year we, we have to look at the data. Um, okay, so it sounds like you're pretty bullish about 2024. I, I am too. And what kind of uh, stocks are you thinking about investing in? Because last year we had had the big sell-off in 2022. Um, one area that did do well was energy. So we were wondering if energy would continue. We now know it, it did not. It's not been a good year for energy stocks. But one of your picks last year was simply to buy the QQQ ETF, which is the NASDAQ. And you said at the time, and I'm quoting you, it sold off the worst, it will come back the first. And we know on the day of uh, recording this on December 5th, it's now up 45% year to date. So that was a great call, John. And I'm wondering if you have another one like that <laughs> for this year or what you're thinking of. Yeah, so let's do uh, my three stocks that I just threw up in large cap trader, Tracy. Those are the ones that I... At least I have some credibility, right? Right, right, for sure. So, Syke, put up SAIC. Put this one up a week and a half ago. And this is Science Applications International. But most people, don't they call it SAIC? I want to yeah, say that SAIC they do. is yeah. its it's kind of its short name. Um, so it's a number two rank, A for value, B for growth, top 20% industry in the IT services. IT services. So... Long term, short term, gotta like this stock. If you scroll down a bit, you can see it just reported earnings and went up 14% like four days after I put the buyout on Goodness. this thing. Yeah. And now go down to the, the actual business, go down to a little bit further down. This is what's interesting Science Applications International is a leading infotech and professional service primarily to the US government. And it's in Reston. So, why did I like this? Because this is technology and equipment, platform integration, engineering, logistics, operation, program support, service, maintenance. This is the infrastructure package, right? Right. And we know a lot of this spending actually got delayed for technical reasons. So groups like this 
in Reston are getting the bid on that infrastructure project. So if you're looking for a clean play, um, this is a stock that you got to like for the next year because of this story. Okay. I see that the PE is 18.4, does pay a dividend yielding 1.1%. And as you mentioned, it did just spike on its recent earnings, but um, still an interesting play for sure. It doesn't get that much, you know, play. It doesn't get that much coverage. Yep. So go to, go to Arista, Arista Networks, ANET. Arista Networks, A-N-E-T is the ticker yep. there. There it is. Okay, here's a, BG, a BBGM with a two rank, uh, top 40 industry. This one's in com communication components. So go down to its description. Scroll down here. There we go, all the way down to the description of, on Arista Networks. There it is. Santa Clara based Arista is engaged in providing cloud networking solutions for data centers and cloud computing environments. So this is Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud Services, Azure Microsoft. This is the AI. This is all of that. This is you know, all these different companies. When you're in the cloud data center business, networking solutions to the cloud, this stock over the last 10 years has been a really, really good performer. I think it's a bit rich right now, but you got to like this stock on the fundamentals because that's fundamentally, if you're buying into what happened on the queues over the last years, it was those big data center build outs. And maybe they got ahead of themselves. Like I said, I'm not sure I put this in at the right time, but I think over time, if I get an entry point on ANET, I, I do like this stock. Okay. As you mentioned, it has a PE of 32.8 right now. But the shares are up 75% year to date. So I'm sure that's Yeah, added. this is a 2x on the Qs if you got it right last year. Um, this is one when you get a big VIX blowout, which we'll get one, something, you know, we'll get the bears back in the game. And that VIX will blow out to 25 or 30 at some point in time. Then you want to turn to buy up eight A net. Right? Okay. And a third one, you have a third, third name too. Yeah, the third one was a biotech. Halo, there it is. Okay, Halozyme Therapeutics, um, VGM of A, used to be a two, now it's a three. This one, go to uh, go down a little bit uh, to the, go pull up its snapshot chart. There, go to the snapshot, hit the PDF on the snapshot. Um, I can't pull that up. Okay. But this one, um, I never know what, what is going on with the therapeutics, like the biotechs. Yeah, so why I like this, I mean... My basic thing I like about this is this company makes money. You're in the biotechs. When the interest rates fall and then inflation gets out of it, risk on comes on, as we've seen. And these, this group may be the group because they make a lot of money already. They have an existing drug. They get two, three ducks a share now out of you know, their earnings from a biotech perspective. They've got licensing agreements with Bristol Myers and Roach and Takeda, J&J &J and all these groups. So this is a play you can see that's going to, it's just super solid. Look at that. They are growing earnings super nice. Yeah, it just put up the price and consensus chart for those people who are listening. And this is how what kind of consensus chart you want to see on this. Yeah, it's, like so it's, big been, growth. it's been tagging along two and a half, three years sideways, like the small caps and the biotechs. When, when the Fed put the rate heat on, these big names got beaten up. But now you've got a nice run again you can get the just looking at that chart you can go to 40 to 60 on 2025 earnings and that doesn't include any m a my activity this company could either you know be bought or buy um because they're going to be a survivor because they're already making three bucks this year they're not a group that you know crisper or these other names they don't make any money i mean I, I, i'm not a kevin cook guy where i got to talk about drama i just got to talk about profits so i got to buy something like this and you can see that 25, 25 earnings, four and a quarter. Right now we're at, you know, three, three and a half. Like I said, three, three and a half a share for a biotech with 40 bucks a share. Not so bad, right? No, it's trading at uh, about 15 times. Yeah, That's 15 times earning on a biotech that makes money. Uh, you know, you get a growth profile here and it's range traded for two and a half years. I got to like this stuff. Uh, speak 
sticking on with uh, the drug companies and like this kind of healthcare-ish type area. Last year, we talked about a couple of the big drug stocks. Uh, Eli Lilly was one of them, ticker LLY. That that I said was expensive last year because it was trading at 47 times. And then I looked now because I know it's had quite the run. It's trading at 88 times forward earnings. And that's because of the weight loss drugs. And everybody wants in on these weight loss, although Eli Lilly also has Alzheimer's and some other stuff. I put up the price of consensus on this one, too. So you can see it's trading, uh, you know, basically at its all time highs here. What do you what do you say about a stock like this? Is it simply still just too hot to handle or should investors just try to get in some of these weight loss ones because that's the next big thing? Well, you should have. I mean, the weight loss was epic in these things like Nova Nordisk. I looked at that revenue growth this morning. It all basically started two, three years ago. You're basically late. Okay. If you're that's reading about it, you're, you're late. And that's what we're doing. We're reading about it. So I would just tell you, you, you know, you have um, missed the boat and don't try to get on it now. Okay. What do you well, say? All that happens is, you know, the people are going to just distribute the stock, right? Those that bought it at two fifty are going to get out at six hundred, and you're going to be the guy on the other end of that trade. Yeah. What do you say about like a Pfizer? I just brought up their chart. It's going the opposite way. Of, Pfizer and Moderna. Uh, by the way, if you take Pfizer and Moderna earnings out of the healthcare sector, um, the rest of the healthcare sector doesn't look so bad. Well, here is the Pfizer and Moderna, are obviously, you know, because they did the vaccination campaigns, you can see um, they have not recovered and they don't look like they're going to recover. Um, and so there you got to buy the stock price and the estimate revision still going down. There's no bottom yet in Pfizer because there's no real catalyst for something else after the immense, you know, focus they had on the COVID-19 pandemic. So don't like Pfizer, wouldn't touch it. You know, even at these levels, I would not go there. The only thing you can say is positive and bullish is that the stock is back at its lows at 30. Um, but, you know, what's the problem here? This is the story of, of any problem of this situation is you don't have a catalyst on a forward look. Right, right. That's always been the troubles with a lot of the drug companies in general. But now some of them do have some of this catalyst with the weight loss drugs at least. So, um, and just other breakthroughs that they are making now on cancer and other things. Yeah. That's why I like Halo over Pfizer, right? Cause I got Halo in it making four bucks a share. This thing makes basically less than that. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. The chart looks terrible, right? Yes. It's terrible, terrible chart. And it's not even on a PE basis, all that cheap. Last year it was trading at seven, times but as we can see on this chart the earnings estimates are on the decline still so even though the stock is down further the pe is still expensive at 19 times so you're not exactly getting those earnings all that cheap really not yet no this is an example of falling knife you don't want to cut this one you, you yeah you might you might be down there on a technical level but um I, I can wait for this to go up and down again a couple times in the two, three years from now. Maybe I'll look into it, but not now. All right. Um, one final question on 2024. What do you think about energy going forward? Because it has had a rough year here. And a lot of those stocks seemingly are cheap. Obviously, it matters on what WTI or natural gas prices are at. But uh, do you have any insights or thoughts about energy you know it could even be you know you still you don't want to be in it <laughs> what what are your thoughts <laughs> you know i i think i've seen some you know vertiv obviously thermal thermal solutions for the cloud environment um and power battery solutions for the cloud environment i would look into but that's going to be based domiciled stocks that are in the you know tech space so nobody on the oil and gas side you're not you know yeah care. i mean I, I've been looking into WTI on a forward look for years now, and, and you know, 78 to 80 is typically the look for the next year. That's true now. So we're at 74 this morning. Um, that, you know, so we're basically range trading, and we're in the range still. Uh, I also don't like Russia because I think Russia, of course, the sanctions are happening, and of course, they're violating them. 
And I, I've told people before that, you know, if you really want to know what's going on, you got to know the five big secretive trading groups in Switzerland. They're actually booking these, these tankers. Because what you can do if you're Russia and they're doing it, there are hundreds of tankers. They, 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 they book these tankers, carry their oil out, go to a third party country that's not in the sanctions environment, swap oil for oil. And, you know, the guy buys your Russian oil, he ships you his Sierra Leone oil or whatever. And, uh, you know, so why is oil down? Because Russians lose, Russia's losing in Ukraine. So there, there goes the, the, that's the bear case. The bear case in, is that r nobody can get in a global market like oil to get the Russian production down. They'll sell it to the Chinese. They'll sell it on swap to whoever and these secretive Swiss firms deal the trading split on that. And you don't know what happens, but you know, on the broader level, it's 74 bucks a barrel. After the Israel Hamas event, so that tells you everything you want to know. That you know, every time the pressure gets heaped up on Vladimir Putin, the more he sells oil to get munitions. Okay, so I take that as a no. You, you're not interested. Yeah, in I, 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 you know. And the other thing is, you got you know, you look into the uh, commodity players, nickel, for example, which is part of the battery story. I mean, it's cyclical. We went through the automotive business. Is Albemarle is doing poor because of the lithium's down now? All that's because you know, yeah, fifty percent of automotive is supposed to be in twenty thirty electric in the United States. But you know, if you got to go buy a sixty thousand dollar Cybertruck with a five year loan, you got a twelve thousand dollar nut every of the five years. That's a thousand a month before you even put an interest payment on it. Then put an interest payment on it, and you're looking at fourteen hundred a month. How many people are going to buy a Cybertruck? Some, but that's a very stiff. If I got to sit in a remote working job with a Cybertruck payment of fourteen hundred a month, at least not talking to this economist, you're not going to find me with a Cybertruck. Right, right. And maybe you and me, you're a value investor. I don't think I, <laughs> I'm no. not confident you're going to make a try a Cybertruck up. No, no. Where are you going to put it? Where are you going to put your Cybertruck in Chicago, Tracy? I don't know. I'm not sure it would fit down here. <laughs> Maybe. But and that I don't would know. be that fifteen hundred month payment, you know, that I'm sure you would be like, why do I why did I do that? Right. So then you buy a model three, you're smart enough, you might do that, but I think you'd probably buy a twenty twenty one model three for thirty grand and, you know, save on gas and, and, and park it somewhere you could park. Right, right. So you know, you gotta be bullish used cars. Um you got to be bullish parts, but I don't see how the OEMs and the dealers get a bo boom going in the next year or two. And so that's that's gas demand, right? Or, or you know, I just don't see it. I, I don't think anything is going to happen in that market until we get beyond um, the whole inflation story and we get back to two two and a half percent on the on the broad or the core. Yeah, and. What about uh, one other area we haven't discussed, which is gold? This did not come up last year, by the way. We did not talk about gold. In fact, I don't think we've ever talked about gold, but it's hitting new highs again. And some people are getting kind of bullish on the gold story, and they think you should be in the gold miners here. There are some ETFs you can buy or individual companies. But every time I've gone that route, I've, I've only been burned um, so what's your take on gold for next year? Well, you know, again, this is kind of a rate story. Real rates, real real interest rates drive gold prices. Um, but, you know, on a, a period of time where there's so much uncertainty about whether the Fed does or does not stay the course, um, any, any bet that's going through from real rates into gold is really speculative. So... I can't find anything other than speculation going on in gold. Um, and so, yeah, I would just be buying highs and, and or selling highs and, or buying highs and selling lows and, and not paying attention to how this works because I don't understand gold very well. Okay. That's fair enough. Uh, you know, we'll see where we stand a year from now on the gold scene. Last year, I did notice in our podcast, we did not mention AI a single time. We did mention EVs and Tesla, however, a year ago. Um, so who knows what may develop in 2024 that, you know, kind of comes on the scene and that we'll be covering next year because uh, there is always 
a lot of times something new that pops up. So um, let me recap the stock tickers we talked about on this episode because it's quite a few. We did talk about Signet briefly, ticker SIG. That's the jewelry retailer. They are the largest jewelry retailer in the world, by the way. We mentioned Ulta, ticker ULTA, Ulta Beauty. I do still own it in my own personal portfolio. We mentioned um, SAIC. These are some of John's picks for the year. Um, Halozyme Therapeutics. I'm probably saying that wrong, as I always do. H-A-L-O. Uh, Rista Networks, A-N-E-T is that ticker. Then we also covered um, Eli Lilly and Pfizer, which are L-L-Y and Pfizer P-F-E. And then John at the end there did mention Albemarle, which is one of the lithium producers. And lithium prices have come way down, and so is Albemarle stock, and that is ticker A-L-B as in boy. So as always, you want to be sure to subscribe to get all of our podcasts here on the Market Edge because we are doing the end of the year wrap up. And these are some of our most interesting and intriguing shows. So be sure to get us on Apple Podcasts. You can get us on Amazon Music. You can get us on Spotify. We're on SoundCloud. And for the video podcast, so you can see all the charts we mentioned, you can get those on YouTube. Go over to Zax.com slash YouTube to Zach's YouTube page, where you'll also get some of our other great features like our top stock picks of the week. I really recommend that video. We always do two number one rank Zach strong buy stocks every week. So go find out which companies have rising earnings estimates because uh, that's a good indicator of where those stocks may be going. But be sure to subscribe over there to get everything. And I'll see you again next week with some more stocks.